All right, well, we're going to get started. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Bill Hennessy, and I'm uh, acting president of the Mid Atlantic Renewable Energy Association. Uh, <clears throat> we are a volunteer, all volunteer organization. We've been uh, going for about 15 years, and our uh, driving issue is to, uh, you know, reduce our climate footprint, uh, incorporate renewable energy, and uh, do our part as individuals to uh, help save our civilization and make it a better place for everyone to live. Um, we have monthly monthly speaker meetings. Uh, today we're going to have, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, instead of renewable energy, we're going to be talking about the other side of it and, and how plants can uh, can take some of that carbon dioxide that all our fossil fuels have uh, spilled out over the years. Um, but, uh, before we get to uh, Dr. Tom Richard from Penn State, uh, we have a, a couple announcements for uh, just for our group here. Uh, uh, Phil, do you want to go ahead and? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we'd, we'd like to uh, invite you to our uh, next meeting next month, October 27th. Uh, which is our open mic night, and it's an opportunity for uh, our neighbors to share what they've been doing to reduce their carbon footprints. And uh, it should be followed. Uh, we'll be covering things on the side of solar uh, or energy generation, uh, energy efficiency, and uh, things people have done to improve their sustainability in their uh, yards and uh, so on. So it's a good opportunity to kind of share and, and uh, learn from each other. Um, and that's October 27th at 7 p.m., the last Tuesday of, of October. Um, following that in November, on the 12th of November, it's a Thursday, starting at 6.30 p.m., uh, we will have a discussion of the book Junkyard Planet, which will cover uh, what happens to your recycling uh, after um, it leaves your curb. That's a fascinating uh, world, worldwide tour of what happens. So uh, uh, ideally you'll have a chance to read the book in advance, but if you haven't, that's fine. We'd love to have you. And that'll be a uh, open discussion on November 12th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, to uh, introduce our speaker tonight, uh, I'd like our board member, uh, uh, Chuck Coda to make the introduction. Chuck's a, a chemical engineering uh, professor at uh, Villanova. Uh, Chuck, are you there? I am here, and I'm happy to introduce Tom Richard, uh, who is the director of the Penn State University Institute of Energy and Environment, and is also the uh, professor of biological engineering within the Penn State University system. And he's going to share the importance of biological processes in reaching a carbon negative future and what is needed to reverse are already excessive concentrations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. It's a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Richard. He, uh, I first met him at the Drawdown Conference, which is 80 Ways to Draw Down Carbon uh, that Penn State sponsored in last fall before COVID. And I learned a great deal about the role of plants and food preservation and utility in helping us draw down carbon. So Dr. Richard received a, is, um, will review a range of photosynthetic-based climate solutions, including regenerative agriculture, food waste reduction, and recycling sustainable harvest uh, forestry and biomaterials, as well as bioenergy, including renewable natural gas. So without me talking any further, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard, and I'm sure you will learn a great deal from his presentation. Thank you very much, Chuck. And it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association for um, both inviting me and also for hosting this series, um, which is a, a great way to connect and to, to share knowledge. Um, so this is the Pennsylvania forest. And uh, as all of you know, we're, um, we're one of the two states that's named for its, its plants, um, Florida being the other one. And, uh, and we have got some tremendous plant resources here. Um, and uh, that was obvious to William Penn and the, the colonial folks. Um, 
I, sometimes I think it's not as obvious to us today. Uh, it's obviously a beautiful state and we en enjoy our forests and our agricultural landscapes, but I don't think we think enough about how they can benefit us um, in a variety of environmental ways uh, in, in water quality and, um, and biodiversity, but particularly with, with respect to climate change. And um, so that's, that's gonna be the focus of my um, talk today. And uh, I've got a, some slides to share. Uh, some of this will be familiar to, um, to some of you, but I'm, I'm sure many of you will learn some things uh, that you maybe haven't thought about before. So first of all, I, I wanna start out by saying that um, this is just a few hundred years and I could show 400,000 years of, of, of data um, of the atmosphere uh, concentrations of CO2. The, the more recent data from about 1955 to the present which actually pretty much corresponds with my lifetime, um, is from uh, some, some data that's been collected by the Scripps Institute of Oceanography on the Mauna Loa volcano in Hawaii. Um, but, but before that, it's reconstructed from a variety of different sources, uh, and, um, and that goes back, again, hundreds of thousands of years and actually into, into deeper geologic time. The, the changes that we've seen in uh, in my lifetime are really dramatic. Um, you can see from, from really just very close to 300 parts per million to now well over 400 parts per million. And, um, and that's already too much. And again, I could spend another hour talking about the, all the impacts of climate change that we're already realizing, but I don't probably need to take that time today or with this audience. Um, I'll just note that I grew up in California and the fires have increased in intensity over the last just decade by a factor of more than two. And of course this year, far more than that, 10 times what they've seen before, and it's not over yet. Fire season's just beginning. That's just one example, and there are many, many more. The cost of climate change are substantial, and, um, and that actually means that we are, we are needing to really think beyond zero emissions for our society, that, that simply getting to zero is not sufficient. And the, the focus of this talk and also of the drawdown effort is to think about turning that around and actually reducing the concentration of atmospheric CO2 year after year until we get to a point where we actually are back to a stable climate where our, our species and many other species can thrive. We're not there yet. It's going to take us decades to stabilize the emissions and then to reverse them and then to bring them down to zero and then to go beyond zero. But we do need to go beyond zero emissions. We need to get into the negative emissions category. And that's a hard thing to wrap your brain around. At least it is for me. Um, but the, the drawdown effort, and I'll, I'll credit a number of people for that, um, I worked really closely with Chad Frischman, who's the research director, uh, Paul Hawken, who helped found the organization, John Foley, who's the director right now, a variety of research fellows that have worked with them, and communication experts to really analyze, organize, and educate around a portfolio of solutions. Chuck mentioned 80 that they've, they've looked at very carefully, and, and several dozen additional ones that they've looked at as well, and, um, and this is just a pie chart of, of the magnitude of those. Um, some of us, as we were warming up, we're talking about food waste and also a plant-rich diet, which you can see over on the white right are significant opportunities. Um, but there's a lot of other things, and many of them have to do with photosynthesis. I've, I've circled those in, in green as positive opportunities, but also in red as places where what we're doing right now is not what it could be. And, um, and so we can both reduce our, our current emissions and also create some negative emissions by changing the way we think about photosynthesis, the land, plants, our food system, our forests, et cetera. So I wanna start out with some definitions. Um, and the first is that if we're gonna have negative emissions, we have to, in the, the net balance, be pulling atmospheric CO2 and putting it someplace on this planet. Now, that 
could be in forests, and I'll show you how much the trees can soak up and are soaking up. Uh, that could be in soil, and there's a vast reservoir of soil organic matter that we can enhance and increase. But that also can be in geologic formations, and there are many geologic formations. I'll show you some of the places in Pennsylvania where they exist. Um, deep basalt, saline aquifers, um, areas where we've extracted natural gas or oil or coal, um, and where there's adequate porosity and appropriate cap layers of rock that are impermeable that we can safely store CO2 for at least 100 years. And over time, over those centuries or decades, it will mineralize. And in fact, in some of our basalt formations, it can turn to rock in as little as three years. So, so this is um, both a, a long-term strategy and a very large strategy. That geologic sequestration is one option, but there's also terrestrial sequestration. And I'll share with you some of the things that we can do there. And then there's our own material world as humans, uh, where we can use bi biomaterials instead of other things, steel, concrete, plastic, et cetera. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the carbon benefits for those. Um, I want to use a couple of abbreviations that you may run into, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, that's a term that has most commonly been applied to the fossil fuel industry. As they think about decarbonizing fossil fuels, they have to capture the CO2 that's emitted and then do something with it. And there's been a lot of funding by the Fossil Energy Division of the USDA to think that through and to develop new technologies. In the biomass energy sector, we're basically um, sort of side, side uh, routing some of that technology so that it's being applied to current carbon as opposed to fossil carbon. And, um, and so BEX would be biomass energy carbon capture and storage along the same lines. Now, this, this idea of negative emissions is something that the climate scientists have been using in their analysis for several decades. Um, over on the, the left, you see the, the gray um, sort of increasing in fossil fuel emissions. Um, this actually, this graph is um, partially a projection from 2016. Um, where the business's usual expectation of carbon emissions was gonna keep heading up as, as this gray shaded area um, appears. But in the, the Paris Agreement in 2015, there was a commitment to reduce those emissions by almost every country around the world. And the, the black line indicates what those emission commitments look like over the next few decades. But those were only for about a 15 year commitment. And, and the projections are if we want to get to a stable climate, to hold climate to, to greenhouse gas emissions and global warming to about a two degree warming level, we have to hit zero net emissions by about 2070. And at that point, as you can see, the fossil emissions, which would, which would be the darker tan, would still be around 12 or maybe 15 gigatons of CO2 per year year at a global scale. And it, at that point, we would have to have a negative emissions of the same magnitude in order to have the net emissions be zero. And, and that means growing an industry that doesn't really exist right now and growing it over a, a, a mere three or four decades to a scale which would be um, roughly half the size of, of or a of, of that, actually it would be the full size of the remaining fossil fuel industry and their emissions by that time. So that's a, that's a big um, task and we need to get started on it soon if we're gonna get there. And what I wanna share with you today is some of the ways that that can happen. Um, some associated with energy, but some of them with landscape management, with ecosystems, with agriculture. Um, this, this idea of negative emissions has been analyzed, um, again, by a lot of climate scientists and people that are looking at Earth systems. Uh, this is a, a chart by Sabine Foose, who's also been active in the drawdown community. Um, she's at uh, the Mercata Institute in, in Europe. And uh, the, the two boxes that are colored here are indicating, uh, first of all, what are sometimes called the, the natural solutions. Um, managing landscapes for both soil carbon and, um, and, a sub and surface carbon in, in trees. 
And then the agricultural options to look at um, how to regenerate agriculture, uh, which also can produce lots of carbon, soil carbon sequestration, uh, potentially biochar, and then some of the energy technologies um, that can be used, where we can use energy as energy resources, some of that plant captured CO2. Um, over to the right are other technologies that can create negative emissions. One I'll talk about briefly is called direct air capture. You can think of this as artificial photosynthesis using uh, chemical reactions and catalysis and absorbents to pull CO2 out of the air and, um, and put it into either a solid or liquid or gas that can be done, something can be done with. Um, there are also uh, some of the, what are called geoengineering strategies, enhanced weathering, uh, al uh, adding alkal alkaline materials to the ocean, ocean fertilization, a um, variety of things, uh, many of which are not proven at scale and are considered uh, somewhat, somewhat risky because um, we might overshoot some of those approaches. And uh, so anyway, there's a lot of discussion. I'm not going to take anything off the table myself, but, um, but I'm going to focus on the two the, the categories in the blue and the green boxes here. Although I am going to first mention that dilute atmospheric carbon storage because I think it helps frame uh, what, a, what an engineer might think of as a strategy to mimic photosynthesis in the ways that, um, that we're going to talk about we can actually leverage photosynthesis to do. So this is also called direct air capture. Um, this, this slide's calling it dilute atmospheric carbon storage. Doesn't really matter. Um, DAC. And, uh, and so the idea is you take atmospheric CO2, you um, put together some kind of technology that can concentrate that CO2, which is, as I said, about 400 parts per million now, and get it up to uh, uh, nearly 100% which then allows several things to be done with it. Um, if this was fossil carbon, the, the largest way that, that um, carbon dioxide is used right now in the United States is for something called enhanced oil recovery, where it's actually pumped down into geologic formations and kept there, but it's, it's, um, it's an economic opportunity for the oil and gas industry, because if you pump it into an oil field or a gas field, you can pressurize that field and get more oil and gas out. Obviously, pulling out more fossil fuel that goes into CO2 is not really going to generate you much negative emissions, um, but it is common and it's demonstrated that that technology can work. We can inject millions of tons of CO2 into the ground in a safe way, in a controlled fashion. And, um, and over here on the, the left side of this, this uh, geologic formation here, we can put it into things like saline aquifers, or other porous rock and, and essentially keep it there for hopefully forever, but in, and certainly in terms of geologic time. This is uh, an, an artist rendition of what such a um, direct air capture facility could look like. There are pilot scale facilities at several places in the world, um, a, a lot of interest in this. Uh, it, it is fairly energy intensive and also capital intensive. Um, many times what the other bio-based technology as I'll describe to you today are, but um, it has the advantage of being something that you could put up in desert environments where there's not enough water or soil to, to grow plants well. Um, and you could power it with solar energy or wind energy or some other renewable source. So um, there, there's definitely some potential for this technology. It's practically, it's, it's probably several decades away from occurring at scale, um, but there is active research going on. And again, you can think of it as an artificial approach to photosynthesis, which is really what I, what I wanna focus on the most. And um, this was in The Economist a few years ago, just sort of you know, recognizing uh, at, at that scale uh, or by that sector of, of our society that that plants actually can do something significant with respect to our fossil emissions. I showed you this before. I'm now going to blow up the far right, just the last couple of years worth of data. And I did want to note that since this Mauna Loa um, data has been collected, there's this sawtooth that's really quite obvious, and that's the annual 
uh, fluctuations in atmospheric CO2 that's caused by photosynthesis and net photosynthesis. Here it is blown up those two years where um, during our winter, and there's a lot more land mass than the northern hemisphere, so during the winter there's less photosynthesis on the planet, and as a result our fossil emissions overwhelm the, the photosynthesis in the southern hemisphere, which is still cranking during this winter period, until sometime in May, and then amazingly, photosynthesis cranks up in the springtime, and for the following six months or so, five months or so, it is actually pulling down atmospheric CO2 faster than all of our industry, all of our automobiles, all of our power plants can put CO2 into the atmosphere. And it does that every year, and it does it for free. Um, it's really amazing. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't do it long enough or strong enough to totally offset the, the fossil emissions. And so each year we get another increment. Each year um, that, that peak level in, in May and June is a little bit higher. And, um, and so we've got we've to think hard about several possibilities. One is doing better things with that captured CO2 that photosynthesis has given us as a gift. Um, and, and I think also thinking about how we might use plants to capture more CO2. For, for example, over here on the right, um, just think about the summer solstice in our northern hemisphere it doesn't happen until the end of June. So we've got actually um, that, that cranking going on for a short while before, photosynth before that peak and quite a while afterwards. But if we could get that peak started a little bit earlier, crank it up a little bit higher, um, we might be able to pull down a little bit stronger. And, and you know, again, noting that, that that photosynthesis drawdown every year is about three quarters of, of, the, uh, of the net increase. Um, we don't have to change that too much to really make a difference. However, we have other things that we like to do with plants. <laughs> One of them is food. And, um, and I think all the, all the uh, approaches that I talk about today, we have to think about as an integrated system where um, we have to main, maintain uh, some uh, capabilities to, to supply human needs, perhaps differently than we have in the past, as well as ecosystem needs and planet needs. Now, when I was young, there were only about 3 billion people on the earth. So when I look at population increasing from the 7 billion we have right now to 9 billion in 2050. I think that's kind of a small increase. I've seen, I've seen double that in my lifetime already. Um, but it's still not trivial. And what's more important than the absolute numbers of population increase that we expect in the next few decades is the fact that their diet is changing. Across the world, people are, um, poverty is, is in decline, which is a really good thing. But as people have more economic resources, they rapidly change their diets towards ones that are more familiar to us, which are not as much plant-based and more dependent on meat of various types. And a lot of that meat is a, not a very efficient way to produce food. It requires a lot of land and a lot of plant material um, because of course the, the animals that are um, being fed as livestock are also living their lives um, and that's not as um, efficient as, as feeding people directly. So, so that's uh, going to be a challenge. Uh, here in the United States, roughly 85% of our land that's in agriculture is used to produce meat, which is producing less than 10% uh, of our calories and um, so well under 10% of our calories, and, um, and it's a, a bit higher than that in terms of a percentage of our protein, but it's, it's not really essential as any of our vegetarian or vegan friends will remind us. There are also food loss and food waste, and those are occurring at a, a phenomenal rate, and it's actually not getting better. Um, the, the rates around the world are in the 25 to 35% range, that's of the food that's, that's harvested at the field. 
most of those losses in the development developing world are because of lack of, of good, um, what are called the cold chains or value chains or drying technology, post-harvest processing and storage, uh, so that pests and disease and just um, deterioration and degradation of, of that food is happening. And, um, and, and that food doesn't make it to the table um, or to our mouths. Here in the developed world, we don't lose as much to pests and, and decay, but we do lose it to um, aesthetics choices that we make. And we also lose it to food processing as we use mechanized systems to, to, um, to clean up the food, to take off some of the parts that maybe aren't as uh, good looking and, um, and it's fairly massive. I wanna spend a little bit of time also talking about yield gaps and yield caps. Uh, these are the potential to increase the amount of uh, activity we have, biomass capture of photosynthesis in farm and forest land and, and how those connect to um, climate change, which is also putting pressure, pressure on our food system and, um, and where there are some estimates that our, our existing food system is gonna suffer um, significantly in the, in the same time period where we're asking it to do even more. So this is just a, an illustration of some of the estimates of food waste here in, um, in the United States. And I'll note that different researchers find different numbers, but that all of the estimates are between 25 and about 45%. And, um, and I think the most credible ones today are in the 35% in the range, 25, 30, 35%, somewhere in that range. That's an awful lot. If a third of the food that we grow, we can't get into our mouths, then that means we could be using only, well, we could, we could be using two thirds of the land and giving up a third of that land to other purposes if we could, if we could get our efficiency to 100%. Now we're not gonna do that, but I will note that, that um, the trend lines are not good and that we're actually wasting food, more food now than we used to. And, um, and so I would say that there's, there's USDA goal right now, it's been in place for six or seven years, to reduce food waste by 50% in the United States. And I think that's achievable. And if we were to reduce that by 50%, that would free up at least 15% of our agricultural system for other purposes, which is very substantial. So another, another way we can reconfigure agriculture is through what are, what are um, basically the, the modern agricultural techniques to try to get more productivity out of an acre of land, but to do that more sustainably than we've done, so, done in the past. And um, this is an illustration of some work that John Foley, who now directs Project Drawdown, did earlier in his career. He was at the University of Minnesota and before then the University of Wisconsin. And, um, and, and in, as, a, as a scientist and a geographer, he did a lot of global analysis of, of agricultural productivity. And he is, and his team kind of uh, conceptualized this yield gap. And, and you can see that in many parts of, of South America, along, along the tropics, um, Central America, across Africa, South Asia, um, even Southeastern Europe, there are areas where we're only getting 20 to 40% of the land's potential. And that's considered, that, that's considering climate, including water availability, it's considering soils. Um, but in these areas, people are farming the landscape, but they don't have access to the same kinds of management techniques, the same kinds of technologies that we have in North America and Western Europe and Southern Brazil and Argentina where, um, where we have very high yields, and I should mention in Southeast Asia as well. Um, so, so these include irrigation, um, fertilizers, uh, mechanization, um, but, but also um, more regenerative practices, like knowing that if you wanna have a crop for the next 50 years, you've gotta maintain soil organic matter, you've gotta use cover crops, you've gotta recycle crop residues, and, and those things are not happening in all parts of the world, in, in part because uh, farmers are, are not making enough money to invest in those things. And that's particularly true in much of the developing world. Um, so, so there's an opportunity there to really crank up photosynthesis, uh, both to, to increase 
food production, but also other things that we might want plants to do. And this is just an illustration of here in the US, um, the, the kinds of increases in yield that have happened for the major crops as a result of agricultural technology over the last 50 years and the projections for what that could, could be into the future. And there's some uncertainty about that. Um, we do know that for some of these plants and particularly for maize, we are likely to at some point get into a situation where we're really meeting some physiological limits of the plant to, to, to actually um, accumulate water and to capture sunlight effectively. But, but the plant scientists think we're not there yet and there's a lot of opportunity to continue to increase these yields from where we are now to at least 20, 50 um, percent higher than they are today. Now, in addition to using that, addi that, that additional carbon capture that increased yield represents, um, we need to think of places to put it. And I mentioned earlier that soil and, and soil organic matter are a fantastic place to put soil, put carbon. And this is just an illustration of how much there is in different kinds of ecosystems um, today. And these are global averages. Raton Lal, who's a colleague at Ohio State, did, did this analysis. Um, he's a uh, soil scientist who's looked at organic carbon for many decades. Um, I'll note that in grassland systems, in cropland systems, um, in northern systems like tundra, there's very little carbon stored above ground relative to the below ground storage. So most of the storage of carbon in our ecosystems is below ground, except in tropical forests, where more of it's above ground. And then here in Pennsylvania, our temperature, temperate forests are roughly equally distributed. Um, so, so trees are an important way to store carbon, but soil is really important. And, um, and it's particularly important in these wetland environments, which we're trying to preserve for water quality and other ecosystem benefits as well. So we know a lot of ways to get, um, to get carbon into these ecosystems. Um, this is a, a, a list by a group of authors, Chris Gome et al. from a couple, three years ago, um, just sort of estimating um, what potential there is for capturing CO2 in, um, on, a, on an annual basis in these different strategies. And I won't take time to go through them all, but there's a variety of forest systems, both existing forests and also reforestation, or plantations, lots of agricultural and grassland opportunities, which typically are not as big, um, but not trivial, and there's a lot of them. And uh, so, so these are also substantial, and then uh, wetlands as well. And there's not as many acres in wetlands, but again, they're a very strong driver because of the potential for major amounts of carbon storage per acre. So these strategies all show up in the drawdown analysis. You can look there as well as here for uh, estimates of what their potential is over a 30-year th period. Um, it's substantial. It, it's roughly one third of the total carbon mitigation requirements that we're estimating are needed. So you can think about roughly one third in, in these natural systems, um, maybe another third in energy efficiency and another third in renewable energy of various sorts. Um, we need all of those things, um, but we need to think about how to balance them and, and how to look at them in a, in a comprehensive way. Um, I also notice that, note that some of these systems um, are opportunities now because of poor management in the past. And so, um, so changing our management and making sure that we're doing best practices on all of these landscapes is extremely important. And just to give you another sort of comparative value, um, again, the, the earth scientists, the climate scientists estimate that we have a, a carbon budget remaining of, of the atmosphere before we hit that two degree warming and, and things really get quite a lot worse, of on the order of 400 gigatons per year. That's a cumulative number over a 30 or 40 year period. The soils on, in the world's agricultural landscapes has lost about as much carbon as that remaining carbon budget for the planet. 
So, so regenerative agriculture, um, crop cropping systems that actually put photosynthetically captured carbon back into the soil are incredibly powerful and they do scale and they could scale to give us a lot more opportunity um, both to, to achieve negative emissions and to accelerate the potential of getting to that drawdown point in time. So I'm back to this figure I use for direct air capture, um, except now I'm going to add a few things to it. The, the first is um, the way it's conceptualized and a lot of the, the technical development has been for fossil energy. So with fossil energy, you take a fossil fuel out of the ground. Here's some lovely Pennsylvania coal. Um, you put it into a power plant, you burn it, that power plant produces CO2. Um, you may then capture that CO2 from the flue gas, concentrate and separate it, um, or separate and concentrate it rather, so that, um, so that you have that concentrated CO2 stream, which as I mentioned, could be used for enhanced oil recovery or put into deep geologic storage. And if you can put as much of it back into the ground as you took out of the ground, then a fossil energy power system with this carbon capture and storage can get close to the same kind of carbon benefits that wind and solar can, getting close to net zero. That's not happening. It's expensive. The most expensive part is this capture and separation piece because it takes a lot of energy to fight entropy. And um, the entropy or the, uh, the diffusion of, of that CO2 into the air is um, most, um, most dilute in the atmosphere at 400 parts per million, but it's pretty dilute in flue gas at typically about 10 or 12 parts per million. Now our bio biomass energy systems have much more concentrated CO2 streams, which I'll talk about in a minute, but they, they also have other ways to achieve um, carbon benefits. The first, again, is in the plants themselves by capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. So we're not starting with fossil carbon, we're taking it out of the air. Um, and they can put it in the soil. So I talked about that a bit already. Um, a bioenergy plant would, um, could in a combustion plant also have flue gas. But I, I want to note, and I'll show some examples, that some of the bioenergy technologies produce pure concentrations of CO2 or very, very concentrated CO2, which is, um, which is then inherently easier to do things with and quite a bit cheaper to store. Um, one of those that I'll spend a little time on is to use anaerobic digestion to produce renewable natural gas. Um, we also can make ethanol. Um, those things can be used for electricity, for mobility, for chemicals and biomaterials. So some of that carbon can either be used um, as an energy resource or, or it can be put into the material world. Now, this is um, some work that we just published, I guess it was earlier this month, um, but anyway, in the, in the last month or so, um, an analysis we did of the relative carbon benefits of natural ecosystems versus um, more managed ecosystems that include um, a biofuel component and also a carbon capture and storage component. And so, um, I'll just note sort of as examples here, this net primary production is how much carbon dioxide is being pulled from the atmosphere by the plants. In a forest, that's not trivial, uh, sometimes 10 or 15 metric tons of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. But in our managed ecosystems, we can do more with, um, with, with various uh, fast growing um, warm season grasses, um, prairie type grasses uh, with fertilization and management. We can get up to 50 or more metric tons of, of CO2 equivalents per hectare per year. And although some of that will be respired back into the atmosphere, um, some of it we can use to substitute for fossil fuel emissions. And those avoided fossil fuel emissions are, are illustrated over here um, and are roughly equivalent to the amount that is recycled back into the atmosphere. But the other little bit of that net primary production here that's in this red parentheses, um, we can call sequestration, and that can go in the ground. And we've analyzed a number of different systems for that in, um, in different parts of the United States. 
in forest and grasslands. And what we've found is large potentials for, um, for roughly doubling the CO2 benefits of those systems by looking at carbon capture and storage. When we look at the geology that's most compatible with those geologic carbon sequestration options, we see that here in Pennsylvania, we've got a lot of it. Not so much down in the southeast, but it's not that far. And these, um, these areas which are in, that, in your region are actually really good geologic storage locations. These are areas which are basalt formations. And in those kinds of rock, you can mineralize CO2 in as little as two or three years. So very rapid, um, very permanent uh, sequestration of atmospheric CO2. A lot of the areas where we currently do bioenergy, like corn ethanol facilities, are in the Midwest, in Iowa, and Nebraska. And they don't necessarily have good geology, although in Illinois there is. And um, in fact, ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, is one of the biggest um, corn ethanol producers. And they're putting a million tons a year of CO2 into the ground right next to their plant in Peoria, Illinois, as permanent sequestration. It turns out that if you've got a pure stream of CO2, um, it's really pretty cost effective to concentrate and put that in the ground. Um, the, the cost of geologic storage are roughly 20 or $25 a ton of CO2 if you have a concentrated steam like you could have from a, an ethanol or a biogas facility. Um, the cost of, of uh, combustion type systems would be much higher because of the need to concentrate that flue gas CO2. And that's more or less what a coal fired or a um, natural gas fired power plant would look at. But, but there are programs right now in the United States, including a, a nationwide program that's part of the 2018 budget agreement um, and a California program that's available for transportation fuel that will pay much, much more for that, um, that CO2 than it costs to put it in the ground. And that includes long-term monitoring costs as well to make sure it stays there. Um, Friend and colleague of mine, Dan Sanchez, who's out at UC Berkeley, has done a number of studies looking at this potential. We're collaborating on one uh, for here in Pennsylvania now. I'll show you some preliminary results. But when you do the analysis, um, you could actually afford to build some substantial pipelines to move CO2 from the areas where the bioenergy facilities are right now. And these red dots are all the corn ethanol facilities to the geologic formations. Um, He's done some analysis of what uh, at a CO2 cost of, of $60 a ton, which is something that some companies are now uh, willing to pay or at least consider on their, in their balance sheets. Um, there's a, quite a few places where that is cost effective. One of them right in central Pennsylvania. We have one corn ethanol facility in Pennsylvania. It's in Clearfield County, not far from where I live. And it's sitting on exactly the right kind of geology to do that large scale carbon storage. Um, for those that aren't close enough and don't have pipelines, there's also truck transport. Some of that's called virtual pipelines. Um, farmers are using that right now to move renewable natural gas from their farms to pipeline locations to inject it so they can market more broadly over the grid. And that, that concept of renewable natural gas is actually one I want to spend um, a little bit of time on today. So, so you all are familiar with the renewable electricity system we have, where you don't have to have a solar panel on your roof, although I suspect many of this group does. Um, and you don't have to have a windmill in your backyard, and probably few of you have that, um, in order to take advantage of renewable electricity. Because we have a grid that runs from every one of our, to run every one of our houses, and it's connected to the suppliers of renewable electricity, whether they be solar or wind. We haven't really thought as a society about the natural gas grid in the same way. Right now, the natural gas grid is used pretty much exclusively for fossil natural gas. But there is an exception. It's a small one, but it's growing rapidly, and that's called renewable natural gas. So renewable natural gas is a methane molecule, same chemical molecule as fossil natural gas, but that's been produced in, in current time from biological material 
through a process called anaerobic digestion. And, and that process is one which has been practiced in for many decades on both farms and in municipalities at our wastewater treatment plants. And it's also occurring um, in, in our landfills, especially over the last couple decades since we started capping them, lining them with plastic and really trapping the methane that's produced inside. So that landfill biogas can be captured really cheaply. Um, it, it could be made into electricity, but it can also be separated. And because it's about 60% methane and 40% CO2, it's a lot more concentrated and, um, and relatively inexpensive to separate. And um, as a byproduct, once the methane is separated and to produce the renewable natural gas, there's a byproduct of, of nearly pure CO2. So that renewable natural gas can burn in any facility that currently uh, burns fossil natural gas. It's in transportation, it's much cleaner burning than, than diesel fuel. Um, if, it's, if that methane is made from a biogas digester that's on a farm or in a place where the, um, the waste material that's being digested could be food waste, has been otherwise, would otherwise be anaerobic and emitting methane, then the reduction of that methane emission to the atmosphere by capturing it and actually using it usefully and burning it to CO2 is a significant benefit to the climate. And, and then as I mentioned, that CO2 waste stream could be captured and sequestered. So we've been doing some analysis of what this looks like um, because it seems to be an industry that's managed to get legs. And um, this, is, this is a growth rate for renewable natural gas in the US, which is, is a sector that did not exist at all seven years ago. And it's been growing quite rapidly. Um, we're now at the equivalent of about 300 million gallons of gasoline equivalent last year. This year, I think we'll probably hit 400 million uh, gallons of gasoline equivalent. And, um, and, and there, there's potential for many, many more years of this extremely rapid growth. Um, we've done some analysis nationwide and the potential is, um, is substantial, something on the order of 100 billion cubic meters a year of renewable natural gas. Um, that would not fully displace our fossil natural gas. It might only be about 13%. Of, of the fossil natural gas. So we, we do need to really address the, uh, the rest of our natural gas needs, but in specific dedicated um, places, there's potential to, to look at bringing in renewable resources for that. And this slide just illustrates where we think those are. Um, some from, from farms, our livestock farms and, li and food processing operations, uh, the food waste and other municipal solid waste, much of that ends up in landfills, but we've tried to capture that, which does not, um, wastewater treatment plants, and then various agricultural systems um, taking advantage of crop residues and winter crops or sequential crops to try to, um, to, try to generate negative carbon emissions out of them. Um, we've, we've done some studies here in Pennsylvania and uh, again, thinking about that 100 billion cubic meters nationwide, um, we've got a good fraction of that potential here in Pennsylvania, um, maybe 1.5 billion. Um, and uh, actually that's BTUs. It's I think a, a bit more in terms of um, cubic meters of methane. I'll show you that in a minute or two, I think. But, um, but that resource is, um, it's the things we might digest right now, which include livestock manure and landfills and wastewater treatment plants, but a large amount of other materials that we could be digesting if we wanted to. And I've used switchgrass here as sort of a stand-in for perennial grasses. They could, these could be prairie mixtures, um, really any, any kind of uh, um, permanent, permanent grassland that um, we are finding there's a lot of places in Pennsylvania which it's actually would be more profitable for the farmers to, to switch their annual cropland into perennial grasses, make more money, and also improve the environment, including water quality by doing so. We've done that analysis on a county by county basis. Um, I'm not gonna take the time to go through these, but 
Uh, it won't surprise you to know that in the southeastern part of the state, there's a lot of agricultural production in Lancaster, Lebanon, Chester areas. Um, uh, there's um, in the urban centers, there's a lot more um, from wastewater treatment plants, uh, food waste, sometimes landfills. So there's a diverse range of resources. Um, and we've also looked at that carbon storage potential um, relative to the, the potential for capturing CO2. We think we can uh, capture and store more than two billion tons of CO2, 10, uh, two, two billion tons of CO2 every year just in Pennsylvania. So that's a pretty substantial possibility um, and a really big contributor to uh, climate neutrality and eventually negative karma. So um, I'll summarize the opportunities there and the drivers for renewable natural gas. Um, I mentioned that, that, um, that these are incentives. There are lots of small scale digester, literally millions around the world in India, China, all across Europe. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of interest in creating more of this uh, for things like dispatchable electricity to complement the, the solar and wind. Um, transportation, as I mentioned, um, also using natural gas, renewable natural gas for making chemicals and fuels. One of the nice things is we already have the infrastructure, the pipelines are there and they can move the gas to the markets across the nation. And if we rethink that natural gas system to focus on biomass as feedstock, we can get many, many benefits. All right, so I'm about to wrap up here and I'm, I'm in doing so, I wanna just touch on um, a couple of the challenges for renewable natural gas and then finally talk about um, the, the biomaterials space. Um, I, I do wanna mention that methane is a really powerful greenhouse gas. It's, it's got about 36 times the impact global warming potential as CO2 on a mass basis or on a weight basis. And that means if we leak more than two or 3% of methane out of a renewable natural gas system, we're going backwards rather than forwards, especially if we're using something like grasses, which we're not currently turning into methane and leaking on their own. Um, if we move that gas off of a farm, then we need to find other ways to keep the digesters warm in the wintertime because they're, they're living systems and they don't like to freeze. Um, if we use distributed technologies like farm scale digesters, we'll have to get that gas to the market market and we'll need to figure out how to make that technology affordable. Um, that probably includes simplifying digester management. And I think it includes also finding ways to take other kinds of plant biomass, crop residues and perennial grasses in particular, and digest them and probably produce some value added products. So this is kind of a long list of, of challenges, but I, I'm really pleased to note that this, um, this month we've been able to, um, we were awarded a USDA grant in partnership with folks in Iowa to really try to um, develop this and understand all of these challenges and, and hopefully uh, make a dent in some of them over the next few years here in Pennsylvania. All right, so materials. Um, I want to just quickly mention that this is a Pennsylvania industry that also is largely overlooked. So we have in Pennsylvania a wood products industry that, that this year and last year and the year before is generating about six billion dollars of revenue in our state. And it's not very appreciated, um, but it provides a lot of jobs in rural areas, and many of them are good paying jobs. And the markets for Pennsylvania hardwoods are really high value markets. Um, we could do a lot more though. Our, our pulp and paper industry has been in decline for 30 years. A lot of our forests don't produce high quality hardwoods, and therefore we don't really have a market for them. And so if we can think about some other kinds of markets, and there are many, and this just illustrates a few, um, then we have the potential to significantly increase our biomaterial supply. And one of the good things about this is this is pretty much a, a, a long-term removal of carbon from the, from the forest in a way which is more or less permanent, and then allows the forest to regrow. And, and that's a really important concept because a mature forest or a um, a, a totally mature forest is in carbon balance, so it's carbon neutral. And if we want really negative carbon systems, we've got we've to do something with that carbon to keep the, the trees growing faster as they do in a young forest. 
Um, pretty amazingly, uh, on a pound per pound or kilogram per kilogram basis, it's not hard for wood going into particularly construction um, to actually displace the carbon emissions from other materials in construction, such as concrete and steel, by a two to one basis. Um, so for walls, it's between 1.2 and 1.8. For flooring, between two and six times as much CO2 equivalent carbon as the kilograms of wood carbon um, that would go into that. So that's a really big difference. And it allows us to actually create um, forest management systems that are strongly carbon neutral and also allows us to decarbonize our construction industry and our um, both urban and, uh, and rural infrastructure. Um, I will note that um, with what's called mass timber construction or cross laminated timber construction, we can now build skyscrapers 20 and more stories high where wood is the primary structural uh, material instead of concrete and steel. And this is being done around the world today. All right, so I'm wrapping up. Um, and the key takeaways I'd like uh, you to have tonight, and, um, and I'm happy to, to answer questions about these or anything else, is first of all, um, that we, we do need negative carbon solutions. Um, we need net zero carbon solutions too. So we need energy efficiency as much as we can get it. We need solar and wind as much as we can get it but none of those are gonna give us negative carbon systems. And so we're going to need to do something else if we're gonna reduce the atmospheric CO2. And that's where plants and photosynthesis can help. Um, right now they're doing the hard work for us. Those plants are already capturing CO2. And by the way, they run on solar energy. It's a three and a half billion year old biotechnology that totally runs on, CO2, on, on solar energy. Um, and uh, takes CO2 out of the atmosphere and gives us clean water and clean air as byproducts. What a nice thing, a real gift. Um, there, there are, however, in that plant uh, biotechnology space, both natural and technical solutions. We can do a lot for better management of forest and agricultural landscapes to regenerate them. But there are also things we can do with technical solutions, whether that's bioenergy or biomaterials. Um, they can scale, but they need markets. And I think that looking at a combination of, of better managing our ecosystems and better managing plants and photosynthesis on the landscape, plus complementing that with technical solutions such as renewable natural gas and biomaterials are gonna be areas where we need to make big investments, um, start to really learn by doing, and that's going to take all of us working together. So I want to thank uh, the, the students and staff that I've worked with over the last few years and some of the material I've presented today. Um, actually, Distor, who's helping to moderate this call, was also a grad student in my group. Uh, she didn't get to work on this negative carbon stuff because we weren't thinking about it when she was a student, but, um, but this is an area which um, it's been really exciting for the students that, that I have worked with on it. And, and we'd like to do a lot more. So I'll, I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. I have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Oh, good. Um, I have uh, some pasture and I was thinking about the um, green, uh, gr wait, what kind of grass did you call that? Um, sweet green? Not sweet grass. Which grass is what I've probably referred to a few times. Yeah, yeah. Um, what would happen? Uh, could I convert my pasture to that? Uh, it's already just grass, natural um, uh, sort of perennial grasses um, that come back just because you mow. If you mow, the grass grows. That's <laughs> yep. so okay. And what is that? What, 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 um, if I were to plant switchgrass, would somebody come and harvest that, or what happens with that? Uh, possibly. So, so you mind mentioning how big your field is? Oh well, I, I have ten acres total, and I have um, only uh, probably two acres are in uh, uh, yard and barns and stuff. 
Um, so right now, that's probably a little bit too small. Yeah. But I will refer you, and you should, um, on the web, you'll find a group in Pennsylvania called the Association of Warm Season Grass Producers. And, oh. and they have banded together. I think they have about 70 members. Um, some of them have smaller acreages like you. Some of them have, have big, big acreages. Um, and, uh, and they are actively looking for markets. Um, some of those markets are conventional hay markets, like uh, for um, livestock bedding, uh, switchgrass isn't as good a feed as hay is for, for livestock directly, but, right. um, but there's a lot of interest in uh, poultry bedding. There's also a, a really well-paying market in what are called erosion control socks or silt socks. Uh, you probably have seen these tubes around construction sites that are filled with compost or straw. And the, yeah. the construction workers really love the ones filled with switchgrass because they're, all, they're a whole lot lighter. Um, so <laughs> rather than having to use a backhoe to move this thing around, they can just wrap it around their shoulders like a feather boa and take it to the site. And <laughs> so anyway, those, yeah. those are really good markets, of about $150 or $160 a ton of switchgrass for those markets, which is better than you could get for hay. So, um, so oh, well, yeah. worth yeah. exploring. And, and there are also energy markets. Um, there's a company down in Virginia that's looking for another five or 6,000 acres of Pennsylvania uh, switchgrass to feed a boiler at a hospital that, that's being used for renewable power of that hospital in Virginia. Okay, okay. There, um, there are some pastures um, next door. Um, do you think, oh well, I'll talk to the other guys about that. But I did have a really quick other question, which is I have an opportunity to put in some trees. Um, I need to put in a few trees for a uh, privacy screen, but also I could also plant some kind of hardwoods uh, in, the, um, in the paddock area that you wouldn't be a big field like a pasture. Uh, the paddock is an area I can plant. I, I've been trying to develop a wildflower meadow there. Uh, but I could put some trees in. Why not put some? Uh, but what kind of trees would give me the best return on um, conversion of CO2 to oxygen? Yes, great question. Well, the, um, the fastest growing trees are the ones that will do the most. Um, but they may not be the ones that are going to provide you with the benefits that you want, um, ideally. So, so you said it was for privacy reasons. So... Um, <sighs> So really, well, no, I have two opportunities like poplar, locust, uh, there's hybrid willows. Um, they're all going to be deciduous and drop their leaves in the winter. So six months of the year, you won't have any privacy, right? Or right, less. right. No. Um, although willow I actually to... might be a good choice for that purpose because you can plant the stems very close together and, um, and that'll then the stems themselves will form sort of a living fence. And we have seen some people do that. But, uh, but, but I think so, if you want an evergreen tree, you should, um, you should look at what, uh, you know, a little bit depends on the soil type. And I don't, I don't necessarily want to recommend red pine because I think we have too much of it in Pennsylvania. It's was planted a lot in the, going back to the, um, the depression and the Civil, Civilian Conservation Corps uh, where they planted uh, thousands of acres, hundreds of thousands of acres around uh, of old abandoned farmland. But anyway, there, there are many evergreen trees that will be fast growing. Um, I don't, what county are you in? Are you in Pennsylvania? Mon Montgomery County, Marlboro Township. It's, um, yep. uh, it, it's, a, it's an area where uh, very clay soil and I, and I naturally get a lot of baby cedar trees coming up in the pasture, which I have just this year begun to kind of dig them up and pot them so that I can put them into my um, area that I I want them to recover from the digging. Yeah, so I, I think you've already found a really nice species then. So oh, well, you know, it uh, may not so be the fastest growing, but those cedars will provide you with really good screening for privacy and they'll be growing pretty fast. So, and, and they obviously like your soil. So um, they do, they love it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I should <laughs> say I, I'm not a forester, so I'm going to defer, but um, anybody on the call okay. in Pennsylvania or any other state um, in the United States can contact their county cooperative extension folks. And uh, they may well have some resources for you. They probably don't have anything about the best carbon capture trees to plant yet. But if you ask them the question, then they're going to want to 
tell us in, you know, in Penn State or University of Maryland or wherever else to get our act together and get them the information for their <laughs> the busy citizens of Pennsylvania who want who want that information. Hey Tom, we yeah. have we have a really large number of questions here. So all right, yeah, Jeff, I go ahead. I'm sorry, yeah. fire away. <laughs> Maybe we should move on. One that uh, is of keen interest relates to earthquakes and sequestering of CO2 as enhanced oil recovery and the tendency towards increased earthquake activity. Could you comment about that? I would love to. So, um, so one of the things that has frustrated me repeatedly over my career is when we, um, people advance new technologies um, without being careful about doing so and make mistakes. And um, that's happened repeatedly in many industrial sectors. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about regulation these days and environmental regulation. And right now the injection of, of CO2 for enhanced oil recovery and the injection of wastewater, which is part of what's happened in Ohio and, and um, other places, is not well regulated. Uh, and as a result, the companies that are doing it tend to put too much in and then they do cause earthquakes. And that is a, a tragedy, not just because it's, um, and, you know, we don't have, they're not super huge earthquakes yet, or, but they've been as high as five on the Richter scale. But it's, it's, it's really making it harder for responsible management in the future. So, um, so there's a lot of work being done um, by responsible companies to understand how to regulate pressure underground. And, um, and there's a number of, of approaches that have been developed and proven. Um, that ADM plan I was mentioning in Illinois is doing very careful monitoring of pressure and the formations it's, it's storing the CO2. So it, it turns out that the enhanced oil recovery regulation from the EPA was written a while ago and was written um, with the oil and gas industry in mind and maybe by the oil and gas industry for all I know. Um, but the, the, there's a separate class of regulations, it's called class six, which would be what the bioenergy industry would be required to meet. And that would be also for dedicated geological storage where it's not going into enhanced oil recovery. And that requires much stricter monitoring um, and uh, much more advanced planning, uh, much more oversight. So I, I've been working with the DOE on this and I, I'm convinced that there's very safe ways to do this, but unfortunately they're not um, always put in practice by the people that are working under an, a different regulatory structure today. So we have the technology, we just need more policemen. That would be a nice way to paraphrase it. <laughs> okay. Joe, you want to take the next one? Sure. It's kind of three questions in one, but uh, do specific types of plants or trees photosynthesize better? Um, what about those invasive species that we pull? Are we getting rid of photosynthesizers when we pull them? <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, probably yes, um, but I think that, you know, nature loves a vacuum, and so when you pull them, there's something else that will probably be uh, doing a pretty go good job, too. So, so the math is pretty simple. Um, different ecosystems have different solutions, uh, different groups of plants, but, but, but most plants in a perennial landscape where you're not plowing it up every year, they will tend to cover the surface of the land in a way that captures sunlight effectively. And here in Pennsylvania, sunlight is our limiting factor for photosynthesis, as opposed to, at least in most years in most of the state. Now we have some areas that are droughty, but, but we're not a desert where the limiting factor for photosynthesis would be water. So I don't think it really matters that much. As I was mentioning to the previous question questioner, um, fast growing plants will photosynthesize a little bit more intensively. Um, if if you can do something with the carbon over time, um, that's going to be the maximum benefit. Any specific types of plants or trees, Tom, in that regard? Yeah, so I, I think a lot depends on um, the, the situation. So if, if you can move the biomass, the plant material into some sort of um, industrial setting, 
where it will be stored in the long term, then, then the warm season grasses will, will capture the most CO2 per acre. They're really fast growing. They pull a lot in. And in addition, they don't have much above ground biomass though. So you have to harvest them every year and you have to do something with that. And, and, and um, so they produce a lot in a year, but then you have to take it away. Um, their root system though, as I was mentioning, really stores a lot of carbon underground. And in fact, our, our great prairie soils in the Midwest have black dirt down at least 10 feet because of the roots of perennial grasses. So they're really good pumps of carbon down into the roots and into the soil. Um, but um, if you don't have an intensive management system like you know, harvesting every year, then forests, which are of course very productive in Pennsylvania, are a great way to go. And I think um, you know, the, the forest industry has, there's all kinds of, of foresters that help landowners think about how to grow trees more effectively on their landscape. And I think they would be very happy to provide some, some um, advice. But in general, it would be fast growing trees, well adapted to your site. Um, native species will do um, more likely better, especially with pests. And so that's where I would start the selection, Joe. Okay, okay thanks. Tom, I got another one. High yields currently depend on fertilizers. They can't really contribute to a drawdown in carbon emissions if we have to make the fertilizer, I'm assuming. Super That's great what. point. Yes, we build that into all of our calculations. Um, the, the energy cost of agriculture production is dominated by nitrogen fertilizer, more so than the fuel for the tractors, actually. And, and, the, and the process of making nitrogen fertilizer, and I suspect the questioner knows this well, is one that was in, invented um, almost 100 years ago and is um, taking atmospheric nitrogen and concentrating it into nitrogen fertilizer. Very energy well, intensive process. Let's, 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 take, let's take renewable hydrogen and make ammonia. Well, a, a great suggestion. And um, there are also um, entirely natural systems too. So many of us know that legume crops, for example, will fix nitrogen from the atmosphere using solar energy. Um, we used to use them in rotations a lot, uh, but we've gotten out of that habit of using alfalfa, for example, or clover in a rotation to capture nitrogen. So, so both low carbon synthetic nitrogen from hydrogen to ammonia, for example, as you point out, Chuck, and also better use of, of um, plant-based systems to capture nitrogen, I think are both good possibilities and more effective recycling nitrogen. And that includes using perennial plants to, to keep it in the soil so it doesn't contaminate our streams and, and lakes. Joe, you got the next one. Okay, can you repeat the type of geology that is good for carbon dioxide storage? Sure. So actually, there are quite a few types, but the, the, the primary ones, and you can go to the Department of Energy has a website. They have a carbon atlas or carbon storage atlas that you can look at all the different things. But anyway, the, the largest ones are what are called saline aquifers. And these are deep, typically a mile or below, more below the surface. Uh, they're filled <clears throat> with salt water. Um, it's actually not just clean salt water like the ocean but it's pretty contaminated sometimes with radionuclides and things like that. Um, but it, the, salt, the salty nature of it allows, um, it, at those depths, the CO2 would actually be a supercritical fluid and would behave much like a liquid. And then it can disperse into that saline aquifer and, um, and then eventually harden into rock. So that's, that's one. Um, and that happens in uh, some limestone rocks and it happens in sandstone rocks. Um, and those are um, some of the deep shales in Pennsylvania. The second category are basalt formations. And we don't have as many of them in Pennsylvania, but we do have a few in the southeastern part of the state. There's also some big ones offshore of New Jersey. And, um, and that basalt is a volcanic rock. And that has fantastic chemistry for converting CO2 into rock very quickly into carbonate rock. So those are the ones that I, I think are the highest, uh, most attractive right now. Okay. Um, the, next, the next question relates to, aren't we all doomed if we can't control the population? So I, I just talk agree. Along. Oh, there's a, there's a part two, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> just saying we could talk a long time about this, but 
um, maybe you could focus a few comments on the growth of population um, and how it relates to the carrying capacity of the earth. Sure, well, um, so, so the math is pretty simple. Um, the, the problems that are caused by humans are caused by the product of the number of people by their consumption. And so population is growing um, and it's growing a little faster than we thought it was gonna be growing at this, in this decade. Um, and, um, and it needs to slow down. But, but population is growing a lot slower than our consumption. We're consuming so much more every decade than our ancestors did. And so each of us here in America, especially in Western Europe and other developed nations, is consuming many, many times as much as, as a person would have in our own location a generation or two ago, but also many, many times as much as the people in the areas where population is growing fastest. So yes, um, population is, is gonna grow fast in many of the tropical and developing parts of the world, but their consumption is so much less than ours that um, I think if, if we get our own population under control, it would help. But I think if, if we actually reduce our consumption by a little bit, we actually can more than compensate for that. And um, well, it, if I remember correctly, Drawdown is saying that one of the largest opportunities is education of females so that they have fewer children and move. You do remember correctly, Chuck. And, um, and that's both um, because educated women and girls actually choose to have fewer children, um, but also because they tend to be some of the most creative members of our society and invent other solutions at a greater rate than men like us. <laughs> so it's a double win. There's also some questions here about Gen 4 nuclear. Um, being a solution to truly eliminate carbon emissions. Right, so um, I would put that in the category of solar and wind, that, that um, nuclear can be carbon neutral and, um, and we need as much carbon neutral energy as we can get, as quickly as we can get it. Um, I, I'm not uh, close enough to the nuclear industry to know what the cost um, proposition is relative to solar and wind and solar and wind have gotten pretty cheap recently and I think nuclear is uh, having some challenges competing with cheap solar and wind for carbon neutral electricity but but I, I want to repeat the point I made at the beginning which is that decarbonization is important but we have to think past that we have to think about recarbonization in a carbon negative sense because if all we do is decarbonize our current economy, we're gonna have a climate that is contaminated with too much CO2 and not safe for us to live in. We already have that kind of climate. So we have to do better than that. And unfortunately, that's not gonna happen with solar, with wind, with nuclear, or with any fossil resource. Sure. There's another quote. Joe, um, do you have a What kinds question? of assumptions about how trees are harvested, transported, and transformed into other products are needed to get to a carbon negative Great question. scenario? And um, whoever made that question, I want them to help me with our carbon accounting scheme. <laughs> because it, it requires careful thinking and management all the way along the chain. So, um, and I, if I had more time, I could share some examples, but, um, but it does seem that hybrid solutions, hybrid systems are gonna be the best. Um, whatever pathway you head down, um, you're gonna have uh, different uh, waste materials or byproducts that you produce. So right now, um, my assessment is that the highest carbon benefit of a forest tree, for example, is going to be through long-lived wood construction in some kind of building that's going to be around for more than 100 years. So that's the prime opportunity and the maximum benefit. But when you head that direction, 
you can't use the leaves, you can't use the small branches. When you start to saw the wood, you're gonna produce sawdust, you're gonna produce lots of other small, fine bits of wood. And so you need to find products for those. And those might be shorter lived products. And then some of that material may be best used for energy. Um, and again, keeping track of the carbon in the energy and capturing the CO2 and sequestering it or making something else out of that. So, so I see a kind of a value cascade where we, we, we look at the, the, the best possible leverage we have on climate from that carbon. And then as we target that, we take all the side streams that we produce and look for the best way to use them as well. Wonderful. Thank How you. separating CO2 from renewable natural gas, the process and costs associated with getting pipeline quality natural gas? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I actually don't have the answer but I can tell you the current market structure is making it very profitable for the people that are doing it. So, um, so we're, the, the rapid growth that I showed you um, is rapid growth because the people that are, um, that have the expertise to pull off those systems are um, in their own time is the limiting factor. The financing is there, the money is there and the profit is there and they're growing as fast as they possibly can. Um, so the, the technology for the separation is not that difficult. They're both um, pressure swing absorption systems using uh, zeolites and other things that Chuck, I, you probably wouldn't be familiar with more than me, but, um, I but didn't also- ask, I didn't ask the question, Tom. <laughs> okay, um, and, and there's actually a Delaware-based system, compact membrane systems that has some truck-mounted portable uh, membrane separation systems that can be used for CO2 separation. Yeah, I, th I think on an economic basis, depending on the, on the um, scale, membranes is the best solution. Uh, Joe, you got another question? Sure. Can you talk about what would be most helpful regarding soil restoration, perhaps from a policy perspective, for example, in the Farm Bill? Yeah, great. I would love to. Um, so, so I, this whole area of regenerative agriculture is one there's been a lot of uh, interest and attention uh, for the, in the last few years. And it's done a, a bit of an interesting crossover from maybe being in the domain of, of the, um, the relatively small niche of agriculture and organic production, and they would call themselves sustainable agriculture, much more into the mainstream. And that has been around the increasing recognition of the value of soil health which is largely a function of soil organic matter and soil carbon for creating better, more productive crop production. And a lot of that has to do res with resilience in the field because rich carbon rich, organic rich um, soils are much more able to tolerate heavy rains, which you all probably have noticed we have more of here in Pennsylvania and much of the country now, more intense heavy rains and also longer droughts. And we also have more of them in, 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 here in Pennsylvania. So, so farmers are finding that investing in, in these regenerative practices to improve soil health by getting more carbon in the soil are actually making them more money. And they're, they're moving in this direction pretty rapidly. And there are at least three or four private companies that are actually paying them to do that by creating uh, carbon markets so a number of very large uh, consumer-oriented companies are trying to reduce their carbon footprint in their various product streams, and they're actually paying for carbon credits in agriculture. The going price right now is about $15 a ton, and farmers are finding that to be plenty of money to, to pay them to switch out their practices to those more regenerative practices. So I'm, I think it's really quite hopeful. Um, I was at one of those companies' websites this weekend, and there's there's over 20 million acres. One company is enrolled in less than two years in America. That's 5% of American cropland, more than 5% of American cropland enrolled by one company in less than two years in regenerative agricultural practices for those carbon markets. Wow. So speaking of large versus small, we have a question here about dairy farms. Um, it says that 94% of our dairy comes from farms with fewer than 250 cows. Isn't it important 
for small scale digesters to produce renewable natural gas? Yes, excellent. Okay, so whoever asked that question should send me a note too. <laughs> By the way, I'm easy to find on the web. I'd love to talk more. Um, this new grant that I mentioned is, is um, one that we are targeting livestock farms and dairies. And we're, we're thinking very hard about the small dairies. Um, right now, when I talk to a company that's interested in renewable natural gas or, or conventional biodigesters, anaerobic digesters for electricity on dairies, they think we need 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 cow dairies to make money. Um, but one of the things we're working on is can we actually reconfigure that economic model so that we might have a smaller number of cows or maybe no cows, but a lot of other things that go into that digester, um, winter crops, grasses, waste materials, food waste, et cetera. And, and I think if we do that in a smart way, then we can have the equivalent of a two or 3,000 cow dairy on a 100 or 50 cow dairy, and suddenly these digesters can be available to many more farmers. That's, that's uh, an ambition of mine. It's maybe aspirational, but I'm gonna be working as hard as I can on it. Just to follow up on that, I mean, this isn't this part of a distributed energy model where the actual renewable gas could be used on the farm? It is. And, um, and that's being done today by some of the farmers that have digesters supplying their own electricity and heat. Um, there are tractors that companies like New Holland, originally a Pennsylvania company, now owned by Fiat. Um, they make natural gas tractors. So there's all kinds of local uses. And um, yeah, I, I strongly encourage that. Joe? Okay, you may have answered this before, but I'm gonna ask it again just to be sure. Um, would increasing landscape plants in suburban and urban environments contribute to carbon sequestration in a significant way? Um, yes. <laughs> so I haven't run the math on that, and I, I probably should. But, you know, a, a lot of our, um, there's a lot of understanding in the agricultural community about how much farmland has been lost to urban and suburban development. And very little of that land actually has houses or roads on it. Most of it's landscaped, and it is land that, that um, either was in agriculture or forest land and can be a place for sequestration. And a lot of it's some of the best farmland, so it has the greatest potential to store carbon in the soil. Um, what I would suggest for somebody who's thinking about landscape management for, for carbon is to think about where you want trees and to start growing them because they're incredible. Um, but then the places you don't want trees, look for perennial plants. Um, some of the ornamental, I mean, switchgrass is planted around our campus is an ornamental grass. Our landscape crew, when I started talking about this, were like, oh yeah, we got that here, here, here. It's beautiful. And there's many varieties. And there are other warm season grasses like it that are beautiful landscape plantings. But any kind of perennial will help store in the soil. Um, the, the annual flower beds, not so much. So, um, so think about perennials, let, the, let their roots do the work. So um, one last question here, Tom, because um, we have to stop at 8.30, but the person is asking, what are the practices, what are the policies at both the local and um, state government levels to make this happen, to make all these wonderful things that you've talked about happen? Great question. Well, um, I, I think the, the most important one is to put a price on carbon. And uh, economists will tell you, and I was once trained as one, that that's the simplest way to get our economy to move, is, is put, a, put a price on um, that will basically uh, convince the people that have the, the, most, um, the most to gain to make the investments that are needed. And um, exactly what that price is, um, right now there's a social cost of carbon calculation that right now our society's um, essentially paying as, as um, negative impacts on our economy, somewhere between 50 and $60 a ton. So that would be a good place to start, but we might go want to go a little bit higher than that and get ahead of the game. Um, in addition to a price on carbon, I think um, the kinds of points that some of the questions made about keeping close track on carbon and developing better monitoring systems and really looking at full life cycle. Um, in, in the regulatory arena, for example, um, a lot of our bioenergy policies 
Um, and a lot of the bioenergy industry likes the idea that they're going to just, by definition, call all bioenergy carbon neutral. Well, um, that's not a scientific definition because some bioenergy is carbon negative and some of it is carbon positive. And very little of it is actually exactly carbon zero. So, so the way we manage things and the way we regulate them, I think, is important to look towards science for and to try to make the analysis um, as based on fact as possible. And to have a consistent way of counting. Absolutely. Yep. Metrics are really important and common units. Well, yeah, one more, Chuck, if I may, real quickly. Sure. Um, the, Tom spoke a lot about using uh, renewable natural gas. And um, I can see the value is not adding to the yearly planetary excess of CO2 that is produced by fossil fuel. But can renewable natural gas be used to, used to sequester carbon directly? And is the sequestration process of CO2 from renewable natural gas easier than the sequestration process from traditional fossil fuel? Yes, great question. And, <laughs> And uh, well posed. So, so the, the, to answer that quickly, because I know we're out of time, um, the, the biogas comes out of a digester. Well, first of all, we can throw all kinds of things into a digester that are themselves capturing carbon on their way in. And, and that includes all the kinds of regenerative agriculture crops, crop residues, food waste, manure, all kinds of things. So, so step one is to feed the digester well. Step two is when the gas comes out of the digester, it's 60% methane and 40% CO2. If the methane has a market, then the methane separation pays for the CO2 separation. And you have a pure, pure stream of CO2 that's already concentrated and it's available for sequestration. Um, that CO2 at that point in time, if it's at scale, can be sequestered for somewhere between $20 and $30 a ton, and you can get an immediate tax credit for over $40 a ton. So immediately you can make some money. Um, and that's without you know, the additional carbon pricing that I described. So I think it is practical. Um, what we don't have is the infrastructure to make that happen. And when I talk about the CO2 capture as part of an RNG system, um, I usually have to explain myself to people, even those who are in the business and have been so for a while, I, I'm a little bit astounded that we have these, um, these processes to manage carbon, and yet we throw half of the carbon away or 40% of the carbon away without even thinking about it. And that's true in, um, in current biogas systems, and it's also true in, in current ethanol production systems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so, so much. Bill, you want to make some comments? Oh, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Richards for uh, spending some time with us, and it's been a great talk, and uh, we look forward to those small-scale methane digesters. So. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Great questions. It was really a pleasure, and again, my, my email is hard to, easy to find, so feel free to shoot me further questions, and let's stay in touch. Thank okay, you, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.